A Watcher's Duty by Nim P. Sudo Chapter 7 Panic sent Lurian into a sprint. From the demands reverberating down the hall, Hornet must have bumbled into one of his nights. The possibility of an altercation, even violence, flashed through Lurian's mind. He knew his knights were slow to anger, but Hornet was in quite a state. They could easily confuse her wild energy for a threat. Drop your nail! The voice boomed again. Cease! Get down! But why were the knights even active at this hour? They spent most of their time in torpor, if not on an assignment. Lurian cursed and rounded a corner, hopping on one foot at the very verge of his balance. Wait, wait! He bellowed. She is but a child! Stay or... He stopped. In the center of the spire's sparring chamber stood one of Lurian's knights, curved shell lustrous beneath the Lumofly chandeliers. The knight shifted his bulk from side to side, trying and failing to glimpse something behind him. Upon his back skittered Hornet. She had scaled him like a boulder and was gazing upon the great nail that hung there from a silken strap. Where did you get this? Hornet chattered. Did it cost a lot of geo? I bet it cost a lot of geo. Did you get it from the trade district? Are you friends with that grumpy old smith? You look like you'd be friends. Can you ask him to give me one? I bet he'd say yes to you. He could- The knight rumbled like a cavern about to collapse. Remove yourself, beastling. I will become angry. Lurian righted himself and adjusted his disheveled robes. The vessel, which had been trailing dutifully until that moment, trotted past Lurian and up to the Watcher Knight. Hornet poked her head over the side, craning around the knight's pronged horns. Spirit! Did you see this one's nail? It's as big as me! She lifted her arms wide to illustrate, but lost her balance and tumbled face first from the knight's back. To Lurian's relief, the Watcher Knight caught her before she hit the ground. He pinned her arms to her sides, holding the girl like a tramway spike ready to be driven into the earth. You are strange, the knight said. Why do you trespass? Lurian strode over. The child's presence is my doing. Forgive the lack of forewarning, time has been short of late. Though he wasn't one to admit it, Lurian struggled to differentiate his knights. Not due to inattentiveness, but because they were all so damnably similar. From their physique to their voices to their mannerisms, little set the Watcher Knights apart. Even their names rang the same. Tarn, Garn, Crom, Corm. Belvedere had once proposed they be color-coded, with ribbons of dyed silk, but Lurian had prohibited it. They were knights, after all, not scrolls on a cluttered rack. Fortunately, there would be no awkward guessing games this time for Lurian recognized the knight. It was Graham, his watcher captain. The crescent scar stretching from his temple to the orbit of his eye socket was unmistakable. At Lurian's words, Graham lifted his head. Watcher, you return. This is good. We worried at your absence. It was merely a walk through the city, Lurian said, nothing requiring your services. As you may behold, it was thoroughly uneventful. He held up his arms. Graham walked a slow circle around Lurian, as though in search of secret injury. Lurian remained still for the inspection. He knew that protest would do him no good. Graham's reputation as a mother gruz had been well earned over the years. Once satisfied, Graham nodded. You were lucky, Watcher. The city is not safe. Hornet squirmed in Graham's grip, but he did not let go. Sure it is. I didn't see a single dirt carver or corpse creeper or anything. It was almost boring. Graham gave Lorraine a look, the sort that bore with it a thousand questions, but Lorraine only waved it away. The king demanded my presence, Lorraine said. I hadn't the time to rouse you or the other knights, and yesterday's journey had seemed to tire you, so I surmised a bit of sleep. You are the Watcher, Graham said reprovingly. We are the Watcher Knights. Bound to you in shell and blood. If you walk, so do we, sleep or no. Lurian thought back to the previous morning, before his trip to Monomon's archives, to the hour-long delay his knights had caused. How many blows to the head with a broom had it required to awaken Graham? A dozen? Lurian kept that musing to himself. This is Hornet, Lurian said, pointing. 
I imagine in her excitement she did not deign to introduce herself. Oh, right, yes. Hornet wormed free of Graham's hold, tucking and rolling onto the tiles. She rose in a lopsided curtsy. Nice to meet you. Graham thumped himself on the chest. Watch her, Captain Graham. That is the... that is spirit, Lorraine said. For the next week, both he and Hornet are valued guests of the Spire. Inform the other knights accordingly. Hornet is an intrepid child, so ensure that she does not endanger herself during her stay. Graham inclined his head. He was studying the vessel with an intensity Lurian had beheld only once before. The last object of such scrutiny had been promptly bisected. Lurian clapped his claws, drawing Graham's attention. Understood, Watcher, Graham said. Can I see your nail, Mr. Graham? Hornet extended her arms, eager claws flexing. I want to hold it! Graham shot Lorena's sidelong glance. The Watcher shook his head with a vehemence that threatened to unmask him. Chuckling, Graham unslung the great nail and hefted it over his shoulder in one fluid motion. The tapered mass of metal seemed to hum in the stillness. You are small, Graham observed. I'm not that small, Hornet said. I'm still bigger than Spirit. It is heavy, Graham continued. I'm strong. I opened a big door just a while ago. Graham made a show of considering. He whipped the great nail around and slammed it tip first into the floor of the sparring room. With a shriek, the blade sank half its length. Lorraine suppressed a groan. Belvedere had retiled that chamber less than a month ago. He would be horrified to discover this. Could Lorraine send for a mender bug this late at night? Graham crossed his arms. First, a test. Show that you are strong. Draw the nail. Hornet growled and stepped forward. She clenched her little claws while eyeing the deadly instrument. Even half buried, it rose to her shoulders. Carefully, she grasped the hilt and pulled, at first as a test, and then with all her might. Something told Lorian this was a very poor idea. In her struggle, Hornet could cut herself, or worse, actually draw the nail. With her latent power over soul, there was no way of knowing what might happen. As Lorraine was about to speak up, Graham sidled over. You tremble, Watcher. This beastling troubles you. At this moment, you trouble me, Graham. Need I remind you that child is a guest? You are to provide her protection, not peril. How sharp is that great nail? Not it is blunted. For training. Oh. The winch that had been cranking within Lurian's chest went slack. He looked at the embedded great nail and was reminded, again, of the Watcher Knight's staggering power. Hornet toiled at the great nail for some time before a silent audience. For all her wrenching, twisting, and tugging, she made no progress. Lurian kept expecting her to collapse in exhaustion, but that did not come to pass. Graham unleashed his long, low laugh. Youth. I remember youth. Tireless. All the world a game. He turned to Lurian. Would the beastling like to spar? Reflex conjured a no to Lurian's throat, but he held it back. This was an opportunity to both appease and weary the girl at the same time. King knew Lurian had no hope of getting the girl to sleep as she was. With Shellwood... Lorraine asked. Graham didn't reply, instead taking the question as an assent and trundling off toward the knight's barracks. Hornet was so invested in her test that she noticed none of this. Graham returned a minute later with a small crate of hardened shellwood nails, much like the sort from a nailsmith's shop. They were battered and chipped, though serviceable. Graham extracted a pair and held them up. They were toys in his claw. Ensure that you are gentle with her. Lorraine whispered to him. She mustn't come to harm. All will be well, Graham said, patting the air. Do you not see her fire? She is a warrior. Lorraine restrained his doubts and ushered the vessel over to one of the long benches that ran along the sparring room's wall. Even though the bench was simple stone, Lorraine sank gratefully. It had been such a long day. The first of many. The vessel sat beside Lurian and placed its nail umbrella over its knees. With what Lurian struggled to describe as anything but 
anticipation. The vessel watched. Graham proffered Hornet a nail without comment, though she was too occupied with the great nail to take it. Hold on, she grunted, assuming a desperate stranglehold. Just a little more. Graham waited for six heartbeats before grasping the great nail's hilt and lifting it out of the ground, Hornet included. The girl wailed as she dangled in the air. No fair, you didn't wait! Look how much I loosened it! With a shake, Graham dislodged Hornet and several clinging chunks of tile. He stowed the great nail and handed over a shellwood one. Another test. Show that you are swift. Strike me. Hornet held the shellwood nail as though it were a moldering piece of driftwood. Can we use real nails? Graham laughed, one sharp note. No. Now, strike me. He lifted his own shellwood nail, an almost comical defense. Hornet looked around, spying Lurian and the vessel across the room. Their attention seemed to embolden her, and she sank into a battle stance. Okay, then. Nail high, Hornet sprang into action, prodding and swinging, scrambling from side to side. Her blows were at first timid, as though she were still play-fighting with the vessel. But as she failed to find her mark, the blows grew wide and fierce, full-bodied attacks that left her arms vibrating. Graham was unperturbed, however, his lower body perfectly still. He blocked each strike with the barest effort, as though every movement was precious. Lorraine did not consider himself a duelist. Even in his younger years as a far traveler, he had hardly worn a nail, let alone brandished one. Strife, either first-hand or vicarious, brought him no pleasure. However, being royal advisor, Lorraine had beheld more than his fair share of duels. Rarely did a visit to the Pale Court go by without an exhibition bout between knights. Lorraine was often forced to update the king on the city's affairs in the middle of the palace's sparring yard, the air thick with the clang of blunted weapons. If the king could be said to have any recreational passions, then it was undoubtedly the duels of his knights. How he seemed to delight in the sweep of loyal claws, the thrust of fierce nails, the clash of mighty maces. This eccentricity had always confounded Lurian, for the king openly condemned blood sport. There was a reason the Colosseum hadn't been allowed within the kingdom's borders. But as Lurian watched hornets stumble through her battle, unyielding despite the disparity of skill, striving on in the face of the insurmountable, he began to understand. There was a pleasure to be gleaned from witnessing those under one's care rise to a challenge. A pride. The duel dragged on for some time, with Hornet no closer to her goal than before. Graham held his ground, not once lashing out. In her desperation, Hornet had taken to unorthodox tactics, going so far as to leap over Graham's head and swipe at him as she soared by. But this, too, failed. Lorraine stretched and rubbed at his lower back. How much longer would the girl hold out? Surely she'd forfeit soon. He glanced at the vessel. It was no longer watching the fight. At first, Lorraine thought some small object at the foot of the bench had attracted its eye, for its head hung low, but no. It was sleeping. Unprompted, the vessel had fallen asleep, still half upright on the bench. Lorraine made an incredulous noise and shook the vessel by the shoulder. Its head snapped up, gaze darting about before settling on him. I thought you a thing beyond fatigue, Lorraine murmured. But the vessel only stared, as it always did. With a pop of joints, Lorraine stood. Very well, then. Come along. We will find you a bed. The clash of shellwood diminished over Lorraine's shoulder as he guided the vessel down a hall. Just as they were about to round a corner, there came another noise, a hollow resonance, like a cauldron being dropped on a stone floor. Oh no! said a far-off shrill. I'm so sorry, are you okay? But the only response was the thunder of laughter. Lorreen and the vessel slipped into another elevator, the last elevator. A few moments more, and he'd be returned to the soothing familiarity of his lair. As they ascended, Lorraine about-faced and stared pointedly out the towering window that made up half the elevator shaft. He could feel the blind eyes of the spire's statues drilling into his back. Oh, how he hated them, 
It was because of those ostentatious things that he had never allowed guests. A reporter from the city tablet had caught sight of them once, and the very next day Lurian had been chiseled a raging egotist. More than once he'd thought to have the statues covered with sheets, but that would have done little good. His own outline was easy enough to notice, after all. And besides, that would have wounded poor Belvedere. During the early days of the spire's construction, Lurian had operated out of a modest townhouse just off the trade district. Belvedere, his only servant at the time, had spied the blueprints to the spire's upper chambers and decided to add some enhancements, as he'd called them. By the time Lurine had noticed, he was already face to face with his stone doppelgangers. Lurine shook the memory away. He looked down at the vessel. Its head was pivoting from the statues to him and back again. I did not commission those, Lurine said. But the vessel didn't comment. Lurine's quarters were just as he had left them. A clutter. Scrolls and shell tablets littered the place, as though they'd been hurled by a powerful wind. His art equipment was still set up beside the west windows. The paints had long since dried on the palette and brush. Lurian looked at his canvas, to the yellow smear that marred it. Though only a few hours had passed since he'd made that accidental stroke, it felt to Lurian like months. He struggled to recall the painting it was meant to be. A comet, yes? He suddenly felt old and doddering. Lurian took the vessel by the claw and ushered it toward the guest quarters. Some years had passed since the chamber last saw use, but they would suffice for a week's visit. Lurine doubted that Hornet cared if her bed was no longer in vogue. There was no sign of Belvedere about. Lurine had expected to find him fussing over the disorder, maybe stacking scrolls or rearranging furniture. He was always quick to seize such opportunities on the rare occasions that Lurine allowed him up here. Perhaps he had retired for the evening. It was certainly deserved. Lorene opened the door to the guest chamber, only to be assaulted by a storm of dust and the stink of rotting silk. Within whirled Belvedere, a cloth mask over his face, a squid-wing duster in each claw. Beside him was a cart covered in cleaning equipment and fresh bedsheets. Oh, watcher, he said, fighting back a cough. You are here so soon. Pardon, but I've yet to finish tidying up. It has been quite some time, Lorraine said. He stepped back, allowing a fog bank of neglect to exit the room and float down the hall. Have you been at this task since we parted company? Belvedere paused, revealing a wobble in his legs. Well, yes, but it was in dire need of doing. Not a trouble, though. As I promised, it shall be finished forthwith. I beg your patience just a bit longer. The mender bugs informed me that your telescope has been recalibrated. Perhaps the young sir would enjoy a demonstration? Lurian crossed his arms. I feel it would be wise if you retired for the evening. I will conclude this chore before the watcher captain arrives with our other guest. Belvedere clutched the dusters as if Lurian intended to snatch them from his claws. No, watcher. I wouldn't dare subject you to that. Please... Grant me just a moment and it will be done. Without waiting for approval, Belvedere pressed the door shut. The swish of squit wings and Belvedere's intermittent coughing percolated through. Defeated, Lurian shuffled back to the main room. Since he had been deemed unfit for dusting, he decided to follow Belvedere's suggestion. The spire's telescope had been under maintenance for some days now, and Lurian missed the tranquilizing pleasure of combing the city's streets. The vessel would glean little from the demonstration, but that didn't concern him. Lorene looked over his shoulder for the vessel, but it had stopped following him. There was no music on the air, no contrary order, and yet there the vessel stood, frozen some steps behind. What? Lorene asked, in the tone one would reserve for a malfunctioning lever. Come along. The vessel spared him only a glance before returning its intent to something against the back wall. The vessel spared him only a glance before returning its intent to something against the back wall. Too tired for anger, Lurian walked over. There was a gray blur of movement, the flicker of light. Lurian almost startled, but even his clouded mind understood. 
It was his mirror, a polished sheet of metal, propped on carved stone legs. The vessel was gazing at its reflection. Lurian put his weight on the edge of a sitting table. Here he was, the same conundrum before him, the empty shell brimming with thought, the slack puppet taut with will. But now, Lurian had no Hellions to shepherd and no destination to reach. There was time for contemplation. He could resolve this mystery. All he need do was embody his epithet. And watch. Do as you wish, Lorraine said, barely over the patter of rain. The vessel faltered over to the mirror. It lifted the nail umbrella out before itself and settled into a battle stance. But this was wrong, it seemed, for it straightened, readjusted. The vessel pulled at the ruby scarf encircling its neck, draping the limbs in just such a way. Satisfied, it returned to the stance, nail umbrella pointed forward, ready to strike. This reminded Lorraine of a mask fly he had once owned, a birthday gift from Belvedere. The simple creature had always twittered away in its cage, though whenever it spied a reflective surface, a mirror, a pane of glass, it went deathly quiet and lifted its wings wide, seeking to intimidate. It saw a rival in those reflections, an enemy, for it lacked the means to understand anything else. But this was not the same, Lorraine realized. It was too precise, too deliberate. The vessel knew itself as surely as he did. This was practice. This was emulation of a certain rambunctious girl. In clothing, in weapon, in stance. There was no doubt. Lurian almost laughed, though he choked it back. Dare he call this endearing or dire? His mask felt so very heavy. He removed it, though the weight remained. Did the king know of this? He must. In only a day, Lorraine had spied the vessel's defects. The king had likely spent many more than that in its company. The mask rolled end over end in Lorraine's claws. The vessel pantomimed a duel, using the same clumsy attacks Hornet had employed a few minutes prior. It thrust, and the nail umbrella struck the mirror, tolling like a bell. The vessel stopped. It pressed a claw against the mirror to halt the faint ripple. Throughout his tenure as Watcher, Lurian had encountered many vessels within the palace walls. They had been like mannequins through trade district windows, merely objects in a bug's form. But their appearance had never been the same twice. Every visit, another shape, another horn, another fracture. The king had deemed each of them impure, but never what that impurity entailed. Where did they go, those mannequins? Lorraine feared the answer. Enough, vessel, Lorraine said, donning his mask. Come, I will show you something. The vessel lingered just long enough to reposition its scarf, then followed. Lorraine's telescope was a gaudy thing of copper filigree and iron tubes. It stood at the far end of his chambers, leaning out into the dark through a gap in the glass. He sat on the cushioned stool before it and adjusted the eyepiece. This contraption is a product of the archives, Lurian said, a fantasy of Monomon's made real. Through it, one may witness distant things with ease. Splendid, no? The vessel lifted its head but said nothing. With minor adjustments, Lurian continued, these far-off places may be brought to focus. He leaned into the eyepiece and twisted a few knobs along the telescope's casing. The image of a sentry crystallized, walking the streets in a posture that spoke of a long, lonely shift. Behold, before Lorraine was granted the time to rise and cede his seat, the vessel clambered onto his lap and did as was commanded. It peered through the telescope, head cocked at a curious angle. Lorraine recoiled at first, but then went very still. His arms hovered over the vessel, as though it were a dozing bellfly that might explode at the slightest provocation. For a long moment, nothing happened. The vessel kept to its task. Lurian kept to his paralysis. This close, Lurian couldn't help but notice the vessel's shell, snow-white and smooth, lacking in the blemishes that plagued its kin. Even its horns were without flaw, tall and symmetrical. Princely, 
Larian thought. Slowly, he placed a claw upon the vessel's head. It was cool to the touch, almost comforting. The vessel flinched, then craned to look up at him. What am I to do with you? Lurine whispered. But it would not tell him. There was a snap of a distant lever, and a rattle of chains. The elevator ascended, and within towered Graham. Slung over his shoulder like a sack of moss was Hornet. This alarmed Lurine at first, but once the mechanisms quieted, the girl's snoring came clear. Hail Watcher, Graham said. He exited the elevator in a crouch, taking great, though futile, pains to avoid scraping the sides. Lorraine was impressed that Hornet managed to sleep through the scream of metal against shell. I see the sparring proved effective, Lorraine said. How did the child fare? Six bouts, one blow. Lorraine hummed. By Graham's standards, that was no small accomplishment. Few besides the greats could boast that they had landed a strike upon the Watcher Captain. Graham stepped forward and cradled Hornet in his huge arms. You bring strange company to our spire, Watcher. A beastling of the deep nest, and... He trailed off. That same razor focus claimed him the moment he spied the vessel. Lorene lifted the vessel from his lap and placed it out of the night's sight, breaking the spell. So I have, Lorene said. Is this a concern? Graham said nothing, long enough that Lurian feared he may have fallen asleep on his feet again. Their conversations often ended in this fashion. But then Graham cleared his throat and shook his head. No, Watcher. He passed Lurian the sleeping girl. She was heavy for her size. Graham forced his way back into the elevator and offered a bow. With another snap of the lever, he was gone. Lurian sat through the din, and then the long hush that followed. It was ever like Graham to opt for silence over explanation. He stood, struggling under his new burden. Now wasn't the time. Come, vessel, he said, and lumbered down the hall. As Lorene reached the door to the guest chambers, it cracked open, revealing a haggard belvedere. He was splotchy with dust and wisps of old silk. His cart of cleaning supplies hardly moved, though he leaned wholly against it. Hello again, Watcher, Belvedere said. Fine timing. Was the telescope calibrated to your liking? Quite. The mender bugs are nothing if not meticulous. Belvedere nodded half-heartedly. Good. The chambers are readied for the guests. He took a few deep breaths and extended his arms to accept Hornet. I will put them to bed. The only bug you will be putting to bed is yourself, Lurian said lifting Hornet away. Belvedere bristled. Watcher, this is my duty. Do not steal it from me. Lorraine would have laughed at this uncharacteristic asperity had he not feared it would undermine him. You are mistaken. This duty is mine, decreed by the king himself. Now it is time I leveled a decree of my own. You are to take to your rest and remain so until fully recovered. The lesser attendants will maintain the spire until then. I will not behold you at any labors for the next day at the least. Is this understood? Belvedere wiped at his uniform as he grasped for some rebuttal, but the fight left him, and he lowered his head. As you wish, Watcher. He started to push the cart down the hall, but abandoned even that at Lorraine's glower. Lorraine did not take his eye from Belvedere until the bug stumbled into the elevator and vanished from sight. Like a balder, that one, he murmured. He stepped into the guest chambers to exactly what he had expected. Perfection. Not a mote of dust tainted the air. Not a speck of debris littered the floor. The beds, one to each side, had been decorated with new sheets and pillows of purpled silk. Upon the table sat jars of herbs that soaked the room with inviting fragrance. A lone candle lit the space from a sconce upon the wall. Go to sleep, Vessel, Lurian said. He turned to one of the beds and placed Hornet as gently as he could. His back protested, but he reached down to pull the sheets up to the girl's chin. A silly little pleasure rose. He was not yet too decrepit for so simple a task. He looked back to the vessel. It was sprawled upon the ground, not two steps away from its bed, with one arm thrown over its eyes. 
Some dim part of Lurian recognized this posture, but he brushed the observation away. Sleep in the bed, Vessel, Lurian clarified. This time there was no misinterpretation, and Lurian tucked the vessel in as he had Hornet. As the candle was doused and the door to the guest chambers creaked shut, Lurian began fantasizing about his own bed. However, a lone word warbled out of the dark. Lurian? He steeled himself and stepped back inside. Yes, Hornet. Will you tell me a bedtime story? My mother always used to. Claws forward, Lurian found the girl's bedside and sat. I am not the most foremost scholar on bedtime stories, but I will try. Do you know the weaverling and the bell? No. The very hungry grub? No. The three little funglings? Lurian racked his mind, but nothing came. Unfortunately, no. Oh. Would you like to hear about the king's border negotiations with the Mantis tribe? That is a fine story in its own right. No, no, that's okay. Thanks anyway. Good night, Lurian. Of course. Good night, child. Lurian rose, and the door sighed shut.